something about the oak. It gets me. It's like when people meet it, like the person they're going to spend the rest of their life with or something. But for me, I've met oak. <laughs> and I love it. It's just the, the smell. I don't know. It's called sensory experience. I love the process of it, which is ridiculously drawn out, really. Mm. To get from an oak stump to, to these strips it takes ages. Um, but, but I love that process, it's really elemental. It was potentially, I kind of lost track of what tree this was, <laughs> but it was potentially felled in sort of May or June and peeled. We peeled the bark for leather tannery. And then um, this, the actual lengths of oak can stay in the woods because it just stays juicy and green for quite a while. We boil it up and then we can rive it down into these sort of strips that are un undressed. So there's like quite a lot of um, like valleys and ridges on them. And then, well that one's half undressed. Um, and then we can saw them. We can saw them dry for like a few months essentially and then they'll just chuck them in the river overnight and they soak up again and then they're pliable again for work and they can kick, I can roll them up in the blanket and it'll keep for a couple of days I don't use it up yeah I'm quite, I quite often uh, make a basket with all these really lovely colours on them and then when it dries it just loses the, the edge and it turns down a bit So these are like, these are the traditional, oh this one's got a great story. Um, this one I was weaving and then um, I had to finish. And you sort of get to this point and uh, where it's not quite finished and, and leave it to dry. And then you can knock it all back and tighten it up and then put the bottom in so it's got a really tight bottom. And um, I was working late one night, put this in the river. <laughs> uh, just to soak up so I could finish it. Forgot all about it. And then it, <laughs> it rained overnight really badly. I woke up in the morning, could just hear the thundering river. Oh God, no, my basket. Um, and it had disappeared. And then about a month later, someone found it. <laughs> someone found it down by the bridge. And um, there's, like, there's loads of rapids between here and where it was found. So I just thought, well, if it's not gonna have made it through them. And, but I sort of had, I still, there was half of me, or maybe more than half of me, who still really wanted it. I was like, it'll, it'll be fine, I'll, it'll just turn up on the riverbank one morning, I'll, it'll catch my eye. Um, and everyone else was like, was telling me to just let it go. <laughs> let it go, the basket's not coming back. Except one friend who was like, nah, swills are nails, it'll just have like, <laughs> bullied its way through the river. I love the heritage aspect of it, that it's that continued tradition and um, I what I really love about the swills is that it's so embedded in in this landscape that I have such a connection to as well. Um, but I don't I don't have like a, an overpowering nostalgia or something. I don't want to make these traditional baskets to be like it used life to be like it used to be. Like I think they've got a really um, Crafts like this have got a really important place in today's society and in the future. And I like that simplicity aspect of it. And there's so many people um, so ask, ask leading questions, or they're trying to they're trying to say, well, like how could you mechanise this? And um, you know, well, well, why do you go to all that hassle? Like, it is a really time-consuming process. It takes hours to make these baskets, and I'm never going to have a lot of money. <laughs> but, um, but there is such a joy in that. And but people's instant reaction is to like, oh, how to make it simpler? Well, actually, there's nothing more simple than using your body to make something and getting to the point where your body knows what it's doing and it doesn't require a lot of thought or effort, you can do it in a, in an easy way. Yeah, I feel like it's a constant thing as well, isn't it? Um, although you, 
I'm making the same things week in, week out. But you're always there's always different requests coming to you. Can you make this or and like unusual commissions or or even even just thinking about how you market it or like the final touches. There's so many even though you are just making the same well I am just making the same product, really. You've got there's a lot of, you've got a lot of there's a lot of like development. But quite often you can say, yeah, I can do that order but I've got these orders to finish first and then I've got to go to the woodlands and cut the tree and then I've got to have a day boiling it and processing it and then I've got to actually make your baskets, it might be a couple of months and like <laughs> quite often puts people off. Um, I can't just like, I haven't got a little workshop full of pixies making me baskets and then yeah and I think people often get frustrated and think well why can't you just get someone to help you but this this it's a real craft skill you can't just like it took me six years to to learn how to do it properly and to have that connection with the material so you know what you're doing I can't, can't just get someone to help me <laughs> there's no one else trained up but there's a there's that's that like modern thing of oh you have to get bigger you have to get bigger well what I really love about this is that it keeps it all to a one person scale of of business like, there isn't and because of the because of the way you have to manage it's all, it's not just a one person business it's a one woodland <laughs> sort of scale so because of that deep connection to the woodland and the coppice and where I get my resources from I can't just buy a load of swill timber in um, it keeps it all at a really nice manageable scale just keep it kind of simple it, does, it can't get too over complicated cause, because it just can't <laughs> because of the nature of it yeah well the injury I've sort of it, it is hard to to have like some sort of contingency plan isn't it for being a self-employed craftsperson and I did my th a three-year apprenticeship and then right towards the end of that I really injured my back and so straight away my first year of being solo um, I couldn't work, I had, a, I had to have a year off and I probably I should have had two years off but I could only get um, the state benefits like sick pay for a year so I had to, I was that kind of forced back into, into work um, so, and that was, um, yeah, that was quite um, an interesting process of being out of action, and so many, so many personal things going through. Of well, if I, I can't, I'm a practical person. I do things. If I can't make things and like express myself creatively, because I can't, all I'm doing is lying on the floor or <laughs> walking up the lane to ease my pain. Um, then, then what do I do? Who am I? <laughs> without that identity so there was that like deeper thing going on but then but yeah also practically I had no money and you still have things to pay out I still have my workshop to pay out my I think I did cancel my like work insurance in the end and but you still have things to pay out I was getting when I did because I did the, the apprenticeship was in coppicing and just general woodland skills so I'd been doing a lot of charcoal and firewood and um, like hazel hurdles and I was getting sucked down that avenue where I, was, I always knew I really wanted to just make swill baskets so it was a good clean break actually that I physically couldn't do any of that stuff anymore and now I don't want to because well I still can't do it because I'm still not uh, strong in my back really so I couldn't do it so it was a good break because it takes a lot of guts when you've got um, you've got people asking you for for products or, or people just ringing up saying can I have some firewood and you have some but you'd rather be making a basket it's really it takes some guts to say no <laughs> you've got you you you've got to be alert a little bit you're using sharp tools and you don't want to mess up your material so there's like an, a level of alertness isn't there but um, a level of switching off from it and but then 
that was a uh, that tuning in was very initially very mentally exhausting because you think yeah yeah maybe it's like a stepping back from it and slowing down because it initially I was having to think like well what's that bit feel like so what do I do need to do to that bit and when it becomes more it almost becomes more instinctive at some point it's a bit of a dark art but same with all like trying to read a bit of wood isn't it when it's like has a bit of timber so you can see a um, what would potentially be a perfect swill tree in the coppice and um, and then you're cleaving it, so in, like we're quartering it up, so that's uh, a level of reading the timber and thinking, well, is this, is this worth it? Is it, is it going to be okay? Um, that's a chance to ditch it. <laughs> but but the, the material is so hard to find and so rare these days that generally we'd, we'd just use it anyway and then curse it <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> so. So yeah, when, the, when it's been a tree, you can think that's, that's really good and then you cleave it and then when we've boiled it up and we're riving it down into these strips, then that's another chance. Like sometimes it's just really cracky and like heartwoody. We, don't, we just use the sapwood mainly. So at that point, it can be a nightmare. But then sometimes you can cleave and boil something and it'll be beautiful and then when you re-soak it, it's awful. Or the opposite way around, you can boil something up and rive it and it's and it's a nightmare but after a, a night in the river and a couple of days mellowing it's beautiful so it takes some sort of strength of character to get to this point where you've, you've done all that work and it's soaked and you're ready and you need it to make a basket and, if, and then it's crap to then just chuck it away but it's fairly privileged to found it relatively early in my life I suppose and like, there's no worry about what am I going to do with my life. I know I'll always be, as long as my body allows, I'll always be making stuff out of oak. And there's so many different projects I want to try, or like new products I'd like to try making, or you know, ways of testing the material. I can get really excited and think, oh, I want to do this and this and this, and I have to remind myself that I've got the rest of my life to do them all. I don't need to do them all now. Not like, I'm not just a total basket enthusiast. I like these. I like wooden baskets. There's that has to have the the wood aspect of it. I think a lot of it is about the texture of it and the colours and that natural variation. Because you can get a lot of uh, split wood baskets that are just all the same colour, like the hazel ones. And the, the bark side is different colours, but the inside is white, and it's all the same. <laughs> yeah, it, but there's, there is I can really, there's something about the oak that just looks nails. And it is the traditional test of the of the swill that was when when an apprentice they, I mean, they did really long apprenticeships, like six or seven years, and years of that would be just dressing the material or just cleaving it and it was only at the end of the apprenticeship they actually got to make a basket and when they, were, when they got to that point of making the baskets the, the masters would test the quality of them by randomly selecting one of the baskets they'd made on the day and turning it over and standing on it so they can take, a, they can take the strength of a full grown man and that's amazing and a basket and that's something To, yeah, it's partly the strength of the material, but also how it's put together is just so clever. It makes that form from. That's what oh, that's what amazes me a lot about this. Is you go from a strip of stuff like this, and you go to a three D form that's really strong and durable and useful. That's what was really appealing about the hazel baskets. Is you need a knife, and that's it. You can like cut them in the hedgerow, you just cut the sun shoots in the hedgerow and you sit and you make a nick and then you can make these strips and you can make that whole basket with just a knife um, and that for a while was quite liberating it still sort of is because the, the swill basketry is quite you do need equipment, you need a big boiler, you need different size riving knives and a knocker and 
You know, you need to be able to fell a much larger tree in the first place. <laughs> With a chainsaw, really. Um, it's a bit more of a commitment. It's not quite so freeing. But uh, yeah, there's something about me must like that as well. <laughs> must be drawn to that. Um, my knife and my leather pad. Um, got a bodkin. And I'm gonna wooden knife. So, my knocker, my bodkin, secateurs. You could do it without secateurs, really. And then these riving knives, which are crucial, really, for the after the boiling. It's a beast, isn't it? I'm still sort of, uh, I still work with Owen a lot, who mentored me and. Um, when you're stuck on something or having a tough day. Um, I went on one of his courses uh, and made a basket and then and knew I was interested in the, doing the coppicing apprenticeship um, but knew when I'd been on his course that I, that was they were the baskets for me I've got work to do. So throughout the apprenticeship I did other crafts and tried other things and still carried on it, sort of informally, being apprenticed to Owen. Um, I had to persuade him, which I totally get now. Um, it's really hard to, to be pinned down. The beauty of doing something like this is that you can, you know, gorgeous day, you can think, oh, I'll just go out for a walk this afternoon instead. And, um, to be pinned down to having an apprentice or a full-time responsibility like that takes away a lot of that freedom and enjoyment of, of being able to do this. I had this um, moment, I had like quite a lot of emotional stress uh, well over the last year really, my dad was really ill over winter and, uh, and there were times like that where I just couldn't, my head was so, I was like, I was on meltdown basically, so, and I couldn't, I couldn't come to work and do any work. I could, well, I could come to work, but I just didn't have the, I couldn't kick myself <laughs> into doing anything. Cause my head was like everywhere else. Um, which was good that I had the freedom to be able to just not work in a way. But, um, but I, I thought I can't live, I can't carry on living like this. I need some money. I'm gonna have to get a job, and it was devastating. I was like that thought of like it came to me one day. I thought I was like quite emotionally at rock bottom, and then the thought of having to give this up and get a real uh, get a job, even if it was like kind of you know related, like I don't know, work for a wildlife trust, or, you know, something like that. I, it was heartbreaking. That's another part of like the whole. This is something I only realised last year, how I thought I'd just made baskets out of wood and then I realised that actually it's really elemental, like you need the fire to, for that process and, and you need the water as well for be soaking it in afterwards so there's a connection to like these lovely um, mountain rivers that are so much a part of this landscape, just as much as the, the woodlands and the fires. Mm. Um, so I don't like to do mega baskets, this is like, I prefer the smaller ones really. But, yeah, but as a crib they're amazing. I don't know what it is about it, but a lot of people say the baby just loves it and they'll go down really easily in, the, in a swirl. I don't know, they have to be in a natural material rather than, it's just more real and human, isn't it? Um, yeah, quite often people are like, oh, you want to go shop on your website? And I know there's ways of doing it where you can just have like pictures and then like, well, you can order this, pictures of everything you make and you can order this, but I never got around to doing it. And yeah, I just, I don't, I feel like I, I should do that, but then, but, but then I, it's kind of working at the moment. So maybe that's when, it, at a point when things quieten down, and I have to do it, then I should do it then. Depend if well, if I'm doing some 
something really physical, uh, sort of like a woody day, my body really limits that, so I can do like five or six hours. Um, and then I am exhausted. Quite often I think, well, I'll do a morning in the woods and then I go to the workshop and I can't, I'm, I'm done in. Um, but if I'm here, I don't know. It would probably be nine or ten hours, I would think, is like usual. Um, well, there's part of it that I don't like. Um, when I used to copy hazel, I used to try and do it with hand tools. And although people think there's like there's an efficiency involved in doing it with hand tools because everything's neat and you're like you know you have hold of the rod, you chop it with your axe or your bill hook, and then you dress it out and then it's like it's instantly a product. Whereas with a chainsaw, you like <laughs> cut through your stool, everything goes all different ways. So you have to like try and push it all the same way, and then at some point later on. You've got to come back and sort this mess out and dress it out. And that, yeah, I don't know. There's like there is. You've got this tool in your hand, and while it's running, you better just do this bit and that bit and that bit, and then, and then you've got to tidy up after yourself. But there's not really any other way of doing it without because it's bigger material. So around here, there's. I mean, like in the central lakes, it's pretty unwooded, really. But along the southern lakes, is it's quite heavily wooded and lots of valleys uh, um, with loads of woodlands in and there's, so there's all of that and most of it is well there is there is quite a scene around here of coppicing and managing the woodland but a lot of it is unmanaged so there's kind of no point owning, <laughs> owning your woodland really you can manage it for the people sort of easing it through and making it a slot through the bull. These, um, these, like the ribs are called spelks, which is like a dialect word for splinter. You can get a spelk in your finger. And then some of them go through how they're attached in the first place, some of them go through the this slot in the bull, so you have to make the hole in the bull. And once the, once the start of the weave's going, then It just they just slot into the weave and it's full that up at the start. The start's quite hard to get going. The material is what makes it really. Because I guess all the baskets I make, the same standard of skill is going into making them. The reason that some of them are better than others is that the material is so much better. Or maybe my mood when I'm making them is probably quite a key thing as well. Yeah, some material. This stuff's really nice. The stuff we um, stuff we arrived, arrived out yesterday was beautiful. Well, I know that the 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 baskets are fine and they're strong and because um, they'll go on and on and on for for tens of years, <laughs> maybe not hundreds. Um, and you can repair them as well. They tend to wear away on the bottom where you get a lot of use, and you can just like slip new bits in. I could dry that out and then soak it again, maybe, if I didn't get around to using it. But it's not great, then it does get really sort of cracky. It's almost like there's something, there's some quality in the oak that makes it pliable, and if it's over soaked, then that, that is like leached out, maybe. Or maybe it just starts to rot, because it's just the sapwood. Uh, but it's, like, I mean, it's, already had quite, it's already been boiled for like 24 hours. <laughs> and then soaked in the river overnight, so it's had quite a tough treatment, really. And pe a lot of people suggested, because it, it is an issue in the river, this is really fast rising and falling river, so it can rain for like an hour and suddenly my wood's six foot away and I can't get it. Um, <coughs> and so sometimes it can be an issue that I've like lost, my stuff's been washed away or it's just out in the middle of the river and I can't get it because um, it's dangerous so I've thought about having a soaking tank or like a pond or something to soak it in but it needs it goes really scummy and smelly and like mouldy the water would get really if it was stagnant 
if it was um, like still water, it would get really gross. So, uh, yeah, it is like a bit of a nuisance when you're looking for workshops that needs to be near running water. But generally around here, it's water everywhere. Um, just tying these bits to the tree <laughs> so they don't get washed, if they do get washed away they don't go far and then I'm just going to leave it in the river overnight and just weigh it down with a rock so hopefully it won't get washed away. It's really cold when it's washed away and you've got to wade in and <laughs> get it out again in December. But that's long enough, we can leave it longer, potentially. Oh, um, if it's already been dressed, it can just, sometimes you can get away with a couple of hours. But when the water's this cold, it's actually better to, to soak it and then wrap it up and leave it to sort of warm up a bit before you use it because it makes it a bit crackier when it's cold but it's more pliable if it's got a bit of warmth in it a bit of wooden river with the rock on it it's great isn't it high tech <laughs> well, that's what i love it's simple you're using like you're using the natural resources there's not no complicated like soaking tanks and you know it's just for chuck it in the river <laughs> and and like saying about it being elemental it's it's like another way of connecting back to nature because you've got to think well oh is it going to chuck it down tonight well maybe I'll soak this like I can make do tomorrow and I can soak this tomorrow night instead when the river might have dropped because otherwise I won't be able to get it in the morning I don't know it's like an extra connection Instead of just sit, sometimes you're sitting in the workshop weaving away and you can't feel like detached from it a little bit, but then you might suddenly realise that it's chucking it down and I have to run out here and <laughs> rescue my stuff while I can still get it. But it brings you out of, the, out of the bubble a little bit, but in a nice way, not out of the bubble into a world of people, but <laughs> out of the bubble into nature. Who, who discovered you could do this? It's mad. I always think with these kind of things, it was probably, it was probably accident, wasn't it? Maybe, like, I don't know, someone happened to leave a log in a river for like a month and realised you could, you could drive it down easier and then, oh, how do you speed that up? Well, we'll boil it instead. And like, that's, the, that's the mill race for the mill. Goes all the way up to where we put my stuff in the river last night. And this is um, the pipelines to Manchester, the water to Manchester. Good old Victorian engineering, this is the only bridge that still survived the floods last year. They're <laughs> just like, no taking it down. So we actually grew up like walking around um, coppiced woods because they just got like most all of them around here are coppiced really. But never knew what it was. So it was interesting when I started we started this when I started the apprenticeship and I was back in these woodlands that I'd grown up walking in on Sunday walks with my family and 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 like reconnecting to it, but uh, and actually learning what it was. <laughs> well, why do these trees all look like this? It wasn't something I'd ever really questioned because that's what you, that's what I grow up with around. So you don't think well, these trees look different to a single stem tree because that's just what I'd mean. Still there. 
<laughs> That's always a relief. We have um, crayfish in the river. It's a um, site of special scientific interest, this river, because it's got native crayfish in it. And they sometimes come out with the wood into the workshop, so I have to rescue them. So now I try and give it like a, give the wood a jiggle before I take it out. But they're quite scary little things. stuff was, was dry so I need to soak it to make it pliable again but now um, to keep it supple I can I'll wrap it up in the blanket and it'll just stay wet and actually that improves it a little bit because it's really cold so it'll be quite um, it will be like quite cracky and hard so it was freezing I'm actually frozen. So if I wrap it up in the blanket it'll sort of soak in a bit better and mellow a bit. It'll be easy to use. Sometimes you just get the most beautiful tree and and it rives out beautifully and you end up getting so much material out of one tree. And it was a couple of years ago. There's three of us in three of us riving it out. And we were thinking about all the different products that we make, like Owen making his, the, the traditional swills, and then me um, do the swills as well, but then like other commissions. And then um, there's actually quite a few of us work around in the oak coppice, but not all making swills really. Um, so we've got this vague plan <laughs> that we will put, we will do one year um, to have like a one oak. So we'll, we'll just we'll record. We'll take one oak tree down and record and record everything you can make out of an oak tree, because quite often actually, because we're coppicing for the swill wood, and we get the swill wood out, and then anything else is firewood. But then the tops we just sort of, we just brush down and leave in piles, and um, we don't you don't really have there's not really time to make the most of every single bit of the tree even if it could be use, used for something else we've got to focus on the swill baskets really well well we don't have to but that's like what we all seem to prefer to do so it'd be nice to sort of switch perspective a little bit and focus on one tree and say right what can we make out of every single little bit of this tree and then it's almost like um like a reaction to modern forestry as well in a way that like massive swathes of woodland are managed and like it's all done with machinery and um, there's nothing really done with the timber it's not actually managed for value or for products so to then scale it right back down to one tree and say that how much stuff can we make out of this one tree and it would be incredible I think and see what in terms of um, value of the products what that one tree is worth which you know one tree, people just don't think a tree is worth that much money really, but if you've made, if you have some basic skills and you can make it into things, <laughs> higher value products that you can sell on, then it's actually worth a lot. And like it's a kind of respectful thing as well to the, to the tree, to make the most of it. Physically, but, um, but then there's great satisfaction in that as well, isn't there? feeling of being exhausted at the end of the day and it's for a good reason, you know. Yeah. I love these old bridal ways as well. Great. Right? Like another bit of nerdery. <laughs> like how people lived in the in the landscape, the history of it. Bridal ways would have been trodden and for hundreds of years. It's not like that's what I like about footpaths and things in our country and trackways and paths that they they were purposeful, weren't they? They were like the best way of getting from one place to another. They're not just 
trails that have been designed for people to get the best views. <laughs> they were like they were industrial really weren't they? Getting from farm to farm or transporting stuff. So a lot of this is like could be it's not very thick with oak. But it's there is quite a lot of swill oak if you look closely. This one could be a potential. So it's got a crack in the bottom. It's something like about the adventure of this kind of way of life. It's not like adventurous in a like, oh, this is rad, we've got to go and climb the highest peak or do this extreme thing. But there is an adventure in there, in, the, in it every day. You know, like getting in the river for my stuff and if it washes away, there's like, I sort of curse it, but I love it as well. <laughs> I've got to like go and balance out into the river and grab my stuff back. And it's like an ad- adventure in a gentle way. And it's the same with with a day in the woods. There's something adventurous about it. So I've cut most of this in like January and February and then we did the summer cut. We left a nice patch of oak and did the summer cut and peeled it. This is uh, going back really well, surprisingly. So that's proof coppicing works with oak. You don't get, you know, if you cut it in hazel or something, you'll get like five or six foot growth in the first year. And that's, and that's a lot. This is a lot for oak, like a couple of feet or one. And a lot of the time as well, the main, we'll keep like the big standards. Um, and a lot of the time it's more, with oak, it's more about new growth rather than um, regrowth. So we'll get new seedlings coming through. Oh, there's already like a blanket of them just waiting for the light and then they'll all shoot up. I mean, the ideal is kind of 25 or 30 years growth for a, co- for a, s- a nice stem for swill baskets. And um, the reality is that most of our oak coppice hasn't really been. Owen's been like doing it single-handedly for 30 years, so we're cutting stuff that's actually more like 60 years old. So we leave the the big standards and they act as the light pullers. Like they provide a bit of shade so that there's enough enough shade for everything to rush up for the light. Um, And and, and also it's, um, it's nice to have the variety as well. There's still those big mature trees within this woodland so when you when you cut a section, there's still those mature trees here. Um, but it's got quite a lot of wiggles in it. Um, and because you're riving it and cleaving it down the grain, the, s- the straightness doesn't matter. It's more about knots. Um, so that's not really, well, it's, it's quite knotty at the bottom, so it maybe wouldn't be so great. But this, like this one, with all these the little epicormic growths and all the, and little pin, that's had a, a knot in there, so that wouldn't be very good. But like these ones are pretty good, and even that, this is kind of the perfect size really. And this one's a bit bigger, but we work with bigger stuff because you've got. A so from from that tree, we would just go to where the first, well, on this one, we would go to where the first branches start coming out really. So you kind of on this one maybe like eight or ten foot um, and the, this so this bottom half is swill wood and then top half is firewood charcoal whatever we want to make from it we need like smaller stuff for the boiler as well so we have boiler fuel <laughs> that's a pile of boiler fuel and this is yeah it's just the tops we just pile up and leave really which is also good because I think if you take everything out from the woodlands you need to leave some of the carbon and like the nutrients to rot back in. So I think if you take everything out and totally sweep it off, it, you, you, you're constantly taking away without giving back. Buds are 
just on the verge of bursting so you've got like all the tops of the ends of the trees are all this hint of really luminous green to them and then um, all the oak leaf uh, they're called oak leaf moths oak leaf moths but the, the caterpillars are like they all so they hatch up in the trees and I think they f must feed on the buds but then they hang down so you, as you're walking through there's just like these like bright green little g caterpillars everywhere <laughs> like hanging around on massive you know massive um, threads right away from the top of the tree. <laughs> 